Good evening and welcome to Nox Mente. Finally. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a day. Tonight's guest is Sabrina Jean. Sabrina has chased the white rabbit and learned lessons in alternate dimensions. Now she wants to teach the masses that we are not confined to our bodies. Her work is focused on healing the body and spirit with etheric energies manipulated through astral projection and Reiki vibrations. Sabrina, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Excited welcome, Sabrina. This is the, some of the people I've been talking to today, to today already know like that this has been a wild day. And this is ironically, you are the perfect person to be coming on Nox Mente right now. I love the synchronistic universe. Wonderful. I hope to ca calm it down a little bit for you. Calm it down. Yeah, there's well, the astrology is wild, but you are you immediately when I logged in here have. A, just a beautiful energy and grounding there's a definite grounding with you oh thank you but for people that don't know may i mention who your boyfriend is oh please go ahead sabrina is the paramour to someone a popular show we had with Vinny yanuza is i say that right i never do yanuza <laughs> benzuza benzuza yeah that uh, Portland, uh, not uh, Pacific North Weird, which is mm -hmm. one of my favorite local shows. So we've got a tie in there, people, an excellent tie in. And obviously, she's a local girl to me here. We've never met, though. So that's my addition to the book. That should change. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. So let's, um, let's get right into this. Sure. So I'm thinking about the very young Sabrina, way, way, way back, as far as you can recall. What were the things that you, what are the things you can pull up from the deepest memories you have? Oh, I have a lot. Um, I will say in the way of like media, I used to love the TV shows Bewitched and I, would, I Dream of Jeannie. Huge Pee Wee Herman fan. Actually, I am a collector of Pee Wee Herman items even now. Uh, I can't look anywhere in my house without seeing some sort of Pee Wee paraphernalia. Pee Wee and, forever. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> yes. He's, he's my spirit animal. <laughs> yes. um, and uh, I used to watch... Uh, alien shows with my grandmother growing up we watched all the like ufo stuff and when she lived in arizona she would send me little clippets of the newspaper of you know anytime there was a flying saucer in the news and i had a little alien box that i would keep and i would store all these things that she would send me so we kind of had that connection and i remember too very very young I think I must have been three or four, and I fell in love with the movie uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Yes. And yes. So, so see more. <laughs> Be me. <laughs> I um I remember this so clearly, and it's one of my first memories. And I was just sitting in the living room; no one was around, and it just happened to be on the television. And I was just entranced with it, and. My grandmother, who used to, I, I grew up with, with her and my grandfather and my mom. We all lived together. And I remember her walking in, and she used to watch Wheel of Fortune all the time, every day. So she turns it to Wheel of Fortune, thinking that I'm just kind of absent-mindedly watching whatever's on the television. Now, I'm a, I'm a people pleaser. I always have been ever since I was little. So it was very odd when she turns the channel, and I just start bawling. I am just crying. And she, uh, she looks at me, she's like, oh my God, were you watching that? And I just kind of nodded like, yeah. And she's like, oh, oh, okay, well, you know, she turned it back on for me. She forgot her Wheel of Fortune. And it was a real treat when um, about two years ago, we, we all went on vacation together um, to San Diego. And she pulls out these tapes that she has. She used to have this little recorder and and a lot of it was just me and my cousins singing like you know weird little kid christian songs but um but one of them she's on there and she's like all, all right sabrina you know tell tell this recorder what you saw the other day 
And I could barely make words at this point, but I was so excited. And I was just like, there was a plant and there are these people. And it said, feed me Seymour. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love that she had that. I just love it. Have you seen the on that on kind of like a sidetrack the band Hooverphonic uh, with the singer Geiki the one the one and only I think I they did a song the they did a song called Mad About You and it was basically a runoff of that No I had no idea Oh after the show I'll hook you up with the video it's so awesome Oh please do Yeah that's great Your grandmother sounds wonderful by the way she was a magical creature, yes. <laughs> did so did you have a relationship with nature as a youngin? My relationship with nature was all very much tied into my relationship with animals. Uh, my my mother says that when I was very young, it didn't matter what it was, a squirrel, a crow, anything. If I saw any kind of animal, my my legs would start going up and down and I would just be so excited. And um Growing up, you know, if we were going outside, it was to catch snakes or, you know, collect tadpoles and even leeches. And uh, I just, anything outdoors to me was very animal specific. And um, I even worked at the, I was the youngest person hired at the National Zoo in D.C. to run this, uh, this program. I didn't, I didn't run it, but I, but I just helped out these kids that were in this, like, summer school program and they had one specifically about snakes and nobody wanted to help out with that class but I but I definitely did so I got to hold big snakes and teach kids about it and then from there I ended up uh, moving here and uh, working at veterinary hospitals for seven years until I became horribly allergic to cats oh no <laughs> I'm just the <laughs> opposite I, I used to be allergic to cats and now I'm not Oh, maybe someday that'll be my my future. That'd be lovely. <laughs> or you could get a Sphinx cat. Those are awesome. <laughs> I, I want one of those. Those are the hair, hairless ones. Yeah, attitude, yeah. though. <laughs> I know they have attitude, but I think they're so beautiful looking. They are gorgeous. I love that you had all. I love that you're an animal person, and we had like three seconds of that before. But this, you know, that's an. There's something there that we'll get into later. How old were you when you did that? This happens, just FYI. Oh yeah, you kind of roboted out there. I didn't, I didn't hear that. Oh sorry. How old were you when you uh, were at the National Zoo doing that with the snakes? I started at age ten as a volunteer, and then I think after about a year or two. They had me coming in on Saturdays as well for the, the snake class. And that was the one that I got paid for, which I thought was pretty cool to have a check that young. Not That's, sure if it was legal. <laughs> but it's so awesome. It says, it really, it says a lot about you. Are you from DC, the DC area? No, I was actually born here in Tacoma. And um, from third to eighth grade, I, uh, my mom got remarried and, uh, I moved to DC where I went to Catholic school and um, he got stationed back here after eighth grade, which this is home to me. I mean, I remember just unrolling the window and just smelling Washington. Like you could smell yeah. Washington and it's the most beautiful, amazing smell. I can't get away. Every time I leave, I miss it so bad. There's something mm -hmm. out here. That's it, just, it's, it's the, the smell. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a show for but yes <laughs> um okay so i guess that that does speak of uh being so you're raised catholic oh yeah okay so lutheran uh very lutheran until um until i went to dc and my mother didn't want to put me in the the public schools so i went to d um sorry i went to a catholic school and very quickly I saw like the hypocrisy of everything. I was so young and I was just so confused. And I remember I, I wasn't allowed to do certain things that, that my fellow students were able to do. I wasn't allowed to go to confession because they knew I was Lutheran. Or I was, um, I remember I was babysitting. So I had taken in some money and I tried to give $10 to the charity pot that they would go around with every day. 
and they took my ten dollars out and gave it back and they said you're lutheran you can't do this <gasps> and i thought well this is for the poor people what does this have oh. to do with religion so i caught on really quickly where i was like there's no one told me that they're still mad at martin luther <laughs> i had no idea um but yeah i mean i'm, I'm glad that i went it's sort of just like a future witch training school. It's kind of how I see <laughs> That's it. That's right. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. But I went to a Roman Catholic grade school, and it was in those last two years, like seventh and eighth grade, that I realized that I understood and realized it meant that the mass was a, a ritual, a magic ritual. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I had just started playing D&D. It had just come out like the year before. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm like, this is, they're going to raise the dead or something here. Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> Well, it's funny because my, my uncle is actually a Lutheran minister and he was, he was upset with me, not really upset, but he was like, what you do is ritual. And I said, well, wait, you do ritual too. You turn wine into blood every Sunday. And he goes, that's not ritual. That's sacrament. I'm like, yeah, semantics. pretty sure that's the same thing. <laughs> and I, I still stand by, there's nothing more witchy, really seriously witchy than midnight mass at a cathedral, at a yeah. real cathedral with all the incense, the Latin, the mm -hmm. echoing Latin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it is, oh, it overwhelms the senses. Yeah, it's beautiful. It is stunning. I, I haven't been to one since I was married, sadly. I, and back in the Midwest, there are just big, huge cathedrals. It's uh, something I love. I am known to get holy water when I can, dip mm -hmm. in a little dip in a little vial into the holy water to collect it because I also love that blessed water. Oh, I need to do that too. You just bring your own vial and just put it in there all secretly? Yes, girl. Yes. <laughs> why, why do you have to be secret about it? They put it out. It's free. I know, but there's something that feels a little naughty about it. Like if yeah. you're just in a vial of it. Don't so I'm, I'm usually taint, just free. You don't think that would taint your water? Getting no, that, I mean, it's not like... energy not, on it? I suppose it's already uh, soaked in guilt energy. Yeah. I think it, it's a little more like, um, yeah, I suppose it is soaked in guilt energy. That's mm. hilarious, Gary. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just discreet. I don't want the eye, you know. It's, it's I don't know. It's my hang up. But oh, the I creepy do love dude the, on the cross. Yeah, he gives you the evil. Yeah, well, I, I do love the creepy guy on the cross also. <laughs> I love all the accoutrements of, of the Catholic experience. Uh -huh. So, all right, when back here, when you're super young, what was your experience with dreaming and dreams? Okay. Well, I always uh, was a very vivid dreamer. And it wasn't until recently, actually, when I started listening to your podcast, where I started thinking about, you know, did I ever, you know, have lucid dreams or out-of-body experiences when I was little? And there's a couple of things that kind of stand out that possibly I did. Um, and I do remember at one time being very small and my bed was set up right against the wall. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night and seeing this, this hand that, that was almost like it was missing its pinky. It had four fingers and it was very crippled looking and like warts all over it, brownish. And it was coming up from in between the bed and the wall. Oof. And it was extremely threatening. And I remember being able to pull the sheets up and turn away from it. And then when I, when I could again, I looked back at it and it wasn't there. So I don't know if that was sleep paralysis. It happened so long ago. But How old would you say you were at that time? I think I was... Probably, maybe I was actually five or six. Um, so maybe a little older than I thought, because I was in my first apartment with just my mom and my grandparents weren't there. But um, that's, that's really early though. To this day, I will not sleep next to a wall <laughs> with a bed. Like my bed is in the middle of my room. There's no walls around it. <laughs> I'm not letting that hand get me. <laughs> and was that the only time that hand came? Was that the only time for that experience? Yes. Yes. Thank when you, I know. Yeah, it's totally creepy. I'm getting, I got total twilight zone with that. 
did you did you tell your mom all about it i believe i did yeah i don't know if she would remember it but but i believe i did i remember telling the kids at school about it too and that started a whole odd whole odd like just bizarre behavior with the kids at school where someone would be like oh i saw the same thing and and I would get on like detective mode where I'm like, okay, when did you see it? What did it look like? And then all these other kids and the story was getting wilder and wilder. And I remember thinking, they didn't see this at all. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it, I'm sure it was some sort of lesson in like, I don't know, like, like that telephone game almost, but yes. for the paranormal. Yes. Yeah. You, so, and do you recall how your mother talked you down from that? Like, or tried, did she try to... How did she present that with to you? What her I, I don't remember, but I imagine that it was just like, oh, you were just dreaming. You know, what, what, any, what any parent would say, really, you know? Yeah. It, 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 that's, a, that's creepy. Did you have a lot of creepy dreams or paralysis, paralysis type experiences at that period? No, no, nothing, nothing like that. That was pretty bizarre. I do remember at that around that same age, though, two things that I could maybe connect to having out of body type experiences. One would be, I, I remember flying around mm. in my playground one time at school, like after dark. And I remember thinking after that, that I could really fly where I was you know, trying it at home. Like I'd try to run and jump and fly and, uh, it wasn't working, but I remember distinctly thinking these people don't know, but I really can, I really can fly. And, um, and also, you know, I was really upset with the way that we communicate with each other with words. And that might be that I'm also dyslexic. I'm very dyslexic. I'll forget words all the time. Um, but I also think now that I've, I've had so many out of body experiences, I don't use words in them. Everyone just kind of talks with their mind or with their emotions. And this is, this feels like home to me. It feels like where I should be. And I remember being a child and being very upset that we had to use words. And then, you know, when I was older, you know, 16 was my first love. I remember feeling that feeling again where it was like, why do we have to talk? This is, this is not the way it should be. It doesn't feel natural. I want to just put my forehead against someone else's forehead and be able to ex- share an experience and a thought that has nothing to do with language. I'm so with you. Words really do limit our experience. And mm-hmm. there, there is something, this is probably an offshoot for later, or it could be now. I think we're starting to tap into collectively more of this the other senses it seems like because the collective is coming around it's now creating a wave sort of a a type of wave within the collective where these other abilities like telekinesis and all the the tellies uh are becoming an idea of this is possible and i can do this and the more we we start riding that wave, I think it's possible to get there collectively. Oh yeah. And I'm sure just the, just the internet being around and and you got memes and you got all these different ways to say things now. Um, Emojis. Yes. Simple things like this. It's like, it's all starting to happen. Yes. Yeah. Emojis are really glyphs. Well, I think more, more important than emojis for me, are memes because they convey multiple ideas in a single image, which is mm-hmm. essentially a symbol. So you're, you're making these uh, highly symbolic images that convey multiple ideas, which is much better mm-hmm. than words. And that's, I think that's the next evolution of language for us is this, this meme category. And, All right, I'll show you. And- <laughs> No, I'm I'm yeah, vibing yeah. off of that, Jerry. Mm-hmm. I think that that's I think it's moving us into a higher ground, definitely because we're talking symbols now. Right, because right. it lets us think at a higher level, and we need to think at a higher level to transcend whatever fuckery we're trying to get out of here. 
it's like we're going backwards in order to go forwards. Right. And especially with this, our speech being limited even more and more each day with so-called hate speech. You got the air quotes, everyone. You missed them. Yeah. <laughs> You know, where it's a nebulous <laughs> set of rules that define what these terms are that are, you know, were, were previously free to speak. But enough and, politics. <laughs> right. But, I mean, that, that's also part of the power of symbols is that they are sigils and they activate. And so glyphs like that. Let's get to the point where I also, this is kind of another side thing is I feel like it's that time now where we should get to a telepathic communication with others in order to actually try and hone in on some privacy. If that's possible, you know, like I want to send you a, I want to talk to you, Sabrina, and I want to just send it to your, to you telepathically. And and somehow there's something about that that seems more private than being, you know, oh. you know, like this is a personal, I'm sending a vibe of, of thought waves to you. You respond and we all of a sudden have the same frequency, which I think can be completely, uh, I mean, how many frequencies are there? I, can't it be, is it, it's possible that it could just be limitless. So we get on the same frequency, we could have privacy anyway. What? I, I say that we, we start trying this now all the yes. time, everybody, yeah. you know, cause at some point it's going to work. And, and you know, you know, when somebody's watching you with, the, with yes. their eyes on you, you could feel that. So why not, you know, st start sending these mental images or these like Reiki symbols to somebody that's having a bad day, like anything you can with your mind. I think it's, it's very powerful and who knows how limitless it is. And, and let's just start trying it now. I, I have a problem with that. You don't What's have per, you don't have permission to put your energy on those people with the Reiki with anything. So you, you don't think so? Even if it's just positive, I, I think that if they don't if it's want positive. it, yeah. I feel like if they don't want it, though, they'll drop it. Yeah, isn't this part of like your own toroidal field where you you kind of have a filter? So it's kind of like a knock knock, right, or a text that goes to to the outer the outer membrane of oh yeah they they don't have to read that text they don't have to open it but it's there if they want it i guess it's That's just it's I just hear. me then um i prefer to just radiate to all equally and if they pick it up they can because it's not targeted and i've just always felt that if i target someone like that it's against their will i you know i, I hear what you're saying i definitely do that when i do if I were to go and try to like astrally do some healing work, I would never do that without getting someone's permission. To me, that's, that's a big thing. Yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, for me seeing a customer that's having a bad day and as they leave me sending some positive vibes, that's not too big for me. I think that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think these are details that as we move further into whatever is actually going on with the collective, we work out, but I, I like the idea of this. And I feel like it's, um, we've been, I feel like we've been working towards it slowly as a collective. And so it's just about finding the ground rules. Well, cause you're going to think it anyways. Let's say you have a customer, yes. you know, I work, I work in the service industry. I could have a customer that's having a bad day and they're short with me. And maybe in my head, I'll think what a bitch. Yes. But maybe instead of thinking that I could think, I have no idea what this person's going through. And maybe as they leave, I might think like, I hope you have a good day or positive thoughts or here's some light for you. And that's, that's way better for not just them, but like for me personally and how, how my outlook is going to be for the rest of the day. And, and that's totally fine. I have no problem with that at all. I was thought, I thought the image I had in my head was you like walking on the street going, Oh, that guy needs some help. That guy needs some, help. you know, that's mm -hmm. what I was saying. I would never do that, but that's just me. I'll shut up. Yeah, but still, still, even with that, I think it's still setting up like this. As we figure these things out on a psychic level, it's figuring out where our boundaries are so that we aren't just a sponge taking in everything so that there is some sort of doorway. You know, like you actually have to knock on my door. I think it's a great conversation. Yeah. Come and knock on my door. <laughs> We've been waiting for you. <laughs> okay, so back to the you. You said something that has got me um, all excited too. So you were a, a flyer as a young one. 
Yes. It's, yeah. Still now. Yeah. But uh, but definitely as a young one. So it doesn't. It seems like uh, I don't know. At this point, it just seems like people pick it up later. Like we don't have a lot of young youth stories like that. And so I get I get excited. This is why I love the early stuff because I get excited when there's a lot of activity early on. So give us an example of a couple dreams where you're flying. Uh, you know, like some details. Yeah, the only one I really remember at that young age was was being in the school playground when no one was there. Okay. I, I, that's the only distinctive one that I remember. And I and I kind of, and to this day, I kind of fly in this weird way. I was, when it started happening, I was too young. I don't think Mario 2 was out at that point. But if you remember uh, Princess Peach, you could play her as a character. <laughs> yes. Okay, so, okay, she kind of does this little run, and then she glides. Yes. And that's her version of flying, and that's how I always did it, like, as a child. That's what I remember, and that's how I start off now, still. So, you start off with a glide. How, does it transmute in any way? Does it change? Yeah, yeah. Now I've gotten better at it. It's something that I've that I've worked on, so now it's not just, like, a run glide. Now I could... Now I can go up and far and stuff, but it always it's always that little little bit to take off. There's takeoff. Yes. I like I think you're the I I don't know anyone that has said that. I am really enjoying it. It's uh it's you know, like the glide thing. I, I'm in a bubble always, but it does feel like I'm I feel like I'm floating though. But the glide thing resonates with me. Yeah, and that's and that's just for lucid dreaming and regular dreams. It's very different when I go out of body. I want to get into that differentiation with you. And yeah. we'll next, well, let's do it right now. So when your experiences with lucid dreaming and flying and out of body. So first, what's the distinction for you with a high lucidity and then just being OBE? Um, with lucidity... I can manipulate things around me and, and I know I'm dreaming, but I'm still kind of subject to, to what that dream is or, um, I, I, you know, it's easier to describe like astral projection, sorry, out of body stuff for me where I feel a vibration. I feel a separation. Mm hmm and I'm not in control in the same way I am with lucid dreaming. I this is a, that that's I have important. Control. Yeah, that's that's extremely important. And this is this is something that doesn't seem to get a lot of talk on here. Is that difference? And you also mentioned something I find very important in the distinction here is the vibration factor. Yes, it's huge. That's actually why I started so doing Reiki. Really? Yeah, I because there'd be times where I would get that vibration, mm -hmm. but I didn't separate. And in that time, I would you know I'd get out of bed. If I didn't separate, I was left with this really high intensity that I didn't know what to do with, and it almost made me feel like like I was plugged into a light socket, but I was mad about it. Like I, I would have this. It would come with almost this anger, like too much energy that didn't get released. So I, you know, meditated one day and I thought, I need to give this energy to someone. So I, you know, I went through Reiki classes, became a Reiki master. And now whenever I feel that feeling and I don't separate, I just give it to whoever needs help, whoever said it's okay. <laughs> so when, so the very, let's talk about the first time this happened where you were okay first let's make this distinction can you go obe without being lucid first yes and was it always that way yes um i learned lucid dreaming when i was about 16 i got a book from the barnes and noble remember i got that one and automatic writing and uh i love that one, <laughs> it's weird because I didn't like the automatic writing, but but now I'm start. It's starting to happen. Like I'm starting to do some automatic writing with my divination. So it's kind of funny to watch that come into play now. But 
Yeah, I read a book about lucid dreaming and I was 16, didn't have a job. Maybe I did. I might have been working at a veterinary hospital, but I didn't have too many, you know, I didn't have too much to take care of. So I really thought about it and I really practiced. And um, yeah, I started lucid dreaming a whole bunch. And towards the very end of the book, it did talk a little bit about sleep paralysis, which I'm very grateful for. Um, so I got into that and then um, just out of body experiences were happening. Um, very quickly afterwards, just um, not by intent at all. I did not want to do that. <laughs> it was very scary for a very long time. <laughs> but it was like a, uh, so, okay. So when are you in the beginning, were you able to do them? Were, was So lucid dreaming was your gateway into OBE? Yes, I That's, believe so. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, at the beginning of the OBEs, you were a little bit, you found them intim intimidating? Oh, it was terrifying. It would be, um, it would be all of a sudden, I'm just looking at my body sleeping there and I'd be in the corner of a ceiling. And I would just be like, oh my God, what, why, what's happening? And I would just, you know, quickly get right back into my body. Mm hmm and wake, you, you know, then you wake up with a start and you're like, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> you know? Did you think you were dead at any time? I did. Yes. There, and this was actually a time that I took mushrooms. <laughs> I took, I took mushrooms when I was 16 or 17. And then I took a nitrous hit and I remember being out of my body. And just thinking, oh my God, these people don't know. I could watch them. I could watch my friends having a conversation. I could watch myself laughing and thinking, they don't know that I'm either dead or about to die. <laughs> I remember that very distinctly. It was very, very creepy. I've knocked myself out so many times on nitrous oxide. I can't even tell you. <laughs> I, I've got to chime in. I love the nitrous too. <laughs> Oh my gosh, my mom's listening. I cannot say more. <laughs> so take this. I had, I had always heard that nitrous was one of the few gases that leaves your body. 100% of it leaves your body. But apparently there's some disease you can get now from it. Oh, is it Wait, like an what? oxygen type? Is it what? Is it like a lack of oxygen? Yeah. Yeah, that makes well, sense. Well, just from like hyperventilating it? Yeah, but... It's just weird that, no, I don't know, I don't know the exact specifics of how to, you know, get it, get this, this thing. I'll, I forget what it was called, actually, but it does happen to people who do use whippets a lot. I just thought it was weird because so many people are deprived of oxygen from other things and are fine and never develop a syndrome of sorts, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I wonder if they stopped using it in the dental field. No they, because that was the only way you could get me at a dentist is if they had the, you know, they had the gas. <laughs> they, they, they're, you know, they have an anesthesiologist who actually, you know, mixes it properly. So you're not oxygen yeah, deprived. They, yeah, there would be oxygen going with it. Whereas if you're just a kid cracking them in your basement, you're, yeah. you're hyperventilating. <laughs> Into a giant punching bag balloon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love whip. It's so fun. I, I we had them like in the restaurant business. You know, they they have the, the big cartridges and all that, and so it was oh. always terrible of us. I was a you know bartender forever, and that was that was a fun way to get on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so I want to explore this. So I asked I asked specifically about if you felt. Wait, can I ask one question first? Because my experience of oh, yeah, yeah, go, Jerry. I'm sorry. Did you exhibit any psychic abilities before you bought those books, or what, did you have any intuition? -ish? I mean, what made you go to that Barnes and Noble that day and buy that book, those books? Mm -hmm. There was never a point in my life that I didn't think that magic was real. I, you know, I, I do have a story now that you're mentioning it. I was traveling through Montana as a young child with my grandma and my mom, and I think my grandpa was there too. But I remember her being in the passenger seat and I'm in the back and it was just pouring down rain. And I said, and she was like, I wish this rain would stop. And I put out my hands and I said, rain, stop. And just like that, it stopped. 
And then she was like, what? And then I go, rain, go. <laughs> it started again. I did this a couple times until she just yelled and she's like, just make it stay off. Oh. <laughs> and so that stuck with me. You know, it was like, you never, if you believe something enough or if you try for something enough, it can happen. And I, and I never lost that sense of wonder. And I, I, I still to this day will try to turn off the rain, but you know, in Washington, I think, I think, I think Washington state's got me beat on that. Still, that's extremely impressive that you have that experience. Have you tried any cloud dispersion or yeah, cloud busting? The, cloud busting. I think, I, is that the same thing that I saw on like the men who stare at goats where they, they try to burst the cloud? Yes. 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 I have tried that. No avail. <laughs> Keep trying. It works. Okay, we'll do. It really does. I know you can do it for sure. I got it on video. Yeah, and Where's then there's that wonderful video? Kate Bush song. I hate Kate Bush. I love Kate Bush. Saint Kate Bush. I, I like Tori Amos. <laughs> I love Tori too. Also, of course. So I want to I want to explore this this where the time was it only one time when you were OBE where the thought occurred to you that you may be dead. I, I think so. I think every time it was just more of a shocking sort of feeling. And and anyone that's done OBEs, they know that if you get too excited in any sort of way, then you will just go straight back into your body really quickly. So I don't think I really even had the time to think about like, oh, did I just die? It was just like, mm -hmm. whoa, what's my body doing there? Get back in as quickly as possible. Yeah, I find it's like a habit. It's like a, it's almost like a snap in, in you. Um, for me, it's like it's a jerking motion. I just jerk, yep. like my body actually has a jerk experience. Oh, yeah. Yeah, me too. Okay, good. That, and I hear that a lot, but I have heard people, a couple people on this show say didn't, they weren't relating with that jerking experience, which I think is extremely common, but this is why we do this. Oh, so, yeah. It's like, like you're getting slammed back into your body and you wake up with a jerk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's like your muscles, all of a sudden you're like, whoop, back in there. Yep. Do you, so onto the lucid or back to the lucid. So you were lucid dreaming early on. And what did that, the very first time you were in, in the dreamscape and you realized that you were dreaming within it, do you mm -hmm. recall that? Oh, like it was yesterday. It was actually, um, probably 18 years ago, but I was at the time living, um, in Puyallup with my, my mom and my stepdad. And one of the triggers that I learned in this book was that clocks do not stay the same in a dream. So I could look at a clock and I could say, you know, it's 645 now. I look back and I say, am I dreaming? Look again. It's still 645. So in real life, I say, okay, I'm not dreaming. And that sounds like a silly thing to do when you're awake. But if you do this enough during the day, it's going to become a habit. Mm -hmm. So it became a habit for me. And the first time I did it in my dream, I remember looking at my digital clock at my bed and being like, okay, it's 345. Look away, look back. Am I dreaming? It's 430. Wait, <laughs> that's not right. So I was like, oh my God, this is it. I'm dreaming. And I remember walking up to the banister and just going, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to fly down these stairs. I'm going to fly down the banister. And that was the first thing I did was I just jumped off of the stairs and I flew for a little bit and then, uh, I got too excited and woke up, but that, that was the first one. I was addicted ever since. You are such a natural, I, I, I didn't get earlier on what sign are you for the, for the audience here? Sagittarius. You're Sag. Do you know your, the other, like your moon and your rising? Oh God, no, I should. I don't. <laughs> That's all right. Sag is good. Higher learning, all that stuff. My, uh, my favorite teachers in life, by the way, have been Sagittarians. I just love the way Sag is each. Nice. Okay, so in, and I want to still peek back further back into the early, early days. Were you, so in, the, in your dream life as a young kid, 
And aside from the hand experience, we already know, did you have any other kind of scary dreams that weren't like terrifying like that, but that were possibly like the darker, they were darker? You know, none that I recall. I feel like, I feel like that time my life was really foggy, honestly. It's really hard for me to dredge up memories, especially, you know, like sleeping memories of just regular, you know, just dreams that that's it's really hard for me to pinpoint that so and also do you have any recall of of any kind of other dreams through that period that's kind of foggy before you started with this high lucidity um not you know not really i i have a million now that i could say but but nothing nothing back then that i could really point to and also were you did you have so I know that the the fear of the the bed being by the wall and all that, but did you have other of those classic fears like the closet or um oh what? yeah i there'd be i there'd be times where I'd want to run to my mom's bed and just sleep there with her, but I would be too afraid, and this is weird, but I'd be too afraid that all of a sudden gravestones would pop out of the the floor. And something would grab me if I ran to her. So I would just be there terrified at night for no reason, just because I had an active imagination. And (laughs) and back then, I wasn't allowed to watch scary films. My my grandma let me watch that little shop of horrors, which I was on the plant side the whole time. So it wasn't scary. (laughs) My mom was very much like, I can only watch G-rated films. So I don't know where that, that came from. And I never had, I was never too afraid of graveyards. So that's, that's just my only memory of thinking like, I can't leave my bed because of this, you know? Yeah. Did you engage in this, the practice, I call it like, uh, like dead stillness where you would maybe sometimes have that fear and you would try to be as as quiet and as stone like as possible, like with your breath, where you would control your breathing to that extent. Oh yeah, and it's so funny because I remember being a teenager and meeting someone, and we talked about it, and we called it the fear. <laughs> we called the act of doing that the fear, and that's so crazy that you just brought that up. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you know what is so great about that is it's actually a train. It's a, it's an old school, very ancient training. And I find that people that have learned, you learned it through, through that process that came naturally. And, uh, it, it, it's, it's quite potent. I mean, I'll just let people explore that on their own, but you, I just felt like you may have been there, you know, that experience. What's the training for? It's it's Secret just part societies. Of, no, it's a oh. martial it's a martial art. It's a martial it's part of a martial art training. And it's an internal uh it's part of the internal training that goes on that it deals with specific types of dreaming where uh, specific types of breathing where you are getting enough oxygen but it's moving so you're moving so controlled and slowly that your body doesn't move. You don't make any any motions. Uh, I'll just, I'll let that, I'm just going to seed that because I I don't want, I don't want to muddy the dream waters for people that may come on in the future. Sure. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. But that uh, you seem like someone that is there uh, that you just confirmed it. Also, what was the dreamscape like for you early on? Back when I was a kid? Well, you, so we can move closer, but before you became really adept at getting out of body and stuff, so younger you and uh, just encountering the dreamscape, so your okay. senses, you already mentioned like they have a clock changed. and Right, yeah, so I'll move on to like maybe more teenage years. That's when I started getting um, uh, re- repeating dreams, you know, um, where, where there's certain places that I go to, everything's in bright color all the time. Um, it's just very realistic to me. And I've always, even before lucid dreaming, I've always felt like if I was upset about anything, I could just go to sleep. That was always my go-to like, Oh, I'm having a bad day. Go, go to take a nap. 
you know? <laughs> and, and then I really abused that once I started lucid dreaming. Cause I was like, all right, screw this teenage world right now. I'm, I'm going to go, you know, live this other life where I get to dance around with pan in a forest. <laughs> Ooh, I'm intrigued by that. <laughs> <laughs> So, so this was, I mean, this is, this is great. Um, vivid colors, reoccurrence. So you mentioned reoccurrence. Were they reoccurring dreams or are they just reoccurring? Is it reoccurring architecture within the dreams that is stuff, you know, but it shifts. Yeah. 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 There's, there's a couple. Um, one that I've had since I was a teenager is this amazing thrift store that is in Paris. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I'm in Paris, that I have to first find the jewelry store and then it's down the hill from there. So sometimes I'll see the jewelry store first. I'm like, oh yes, the best thrift store ever. Yeah, I just need to go down this hill. Or one time, there's one time where that best thrift store ever was on a train. It was doing a tour. So I could actually see it in Washington and that was pretty neat. But, but it's like all the clothes fit me every single, like just statue item is something that I'd want in my house. One time there was a burlesque dancing show going on in this thrift store, but it's, it's just funny. Cause when I'm in Paris in my dreams, I know exactly how to get there. This is fantastic. I have a shop I go to. I call it, it's more of, for me a bazaar, but you just explained it exactly the same way. And Whoa. it's all <laughs> these goodies, always has goodies, fringe, everything I love. Yeah, so, yeah. So, I mean, it's like Stevie Nicks died in there or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, me too. It's crazy. <laughs> it reminds me of Bazaar Bazaar in Chicago. Remember that place? Oh, my, yes. I wonder if that's still around. It's not. Oh, so this this is awesome. So it, it is there is a, some solid architecture, even though of course it's a dream world and it morphs. But there mm -hmm. there are these solid aspects. On that note, do you have do you have any thoughts about what that is and why that is? You know, I don't know, but I do know that it could be a trigger. I, I believe that everyone should be dream journaling because in my dream journal, you know, I got that really awesome thrift store. I always have weird things with animals, like hurt animals. I always have really bad issues with transportation. These are things that always happen. So if you can write these down, realize that you have a pattern, that's your ticket to, to realize it and go, okay, now I can go out of body or now I can go lose it. So it's it's important for some reason. I'm not exactly sure what it means, but I know in that sense that th this is a tool. Yes, absolutely. So since you're exercising this level of will on the dreamscape, so say there's a, give us an example before we get into that, I guess. Give us an example of the hurt animals, of course, pique my interest. Uh, yeah, I think that came with me working at veterinary hospitals for seven years. It's just uh, something that while I was working there, I don't think I had too many bad dreams about it. I think I kind of had the mindset of like, we're helping these animals, you know, and it was my day to day job. Afterwards, that's when it really started affecting me, where um, they started, you know, being in my dreams where I'm always, always helping some sort of hurt animal. Do you think that, so while you were do, doing the veterinary stuff, do you think that was more like problem solving, just daytime related to the daytime stuff? Oh yeah, for sure. You had to take your emotions out of it in a mm -hmm. way. I mean, of course you're sad, you feel, but you can't be an empath working and, you know, putting someone's cat down while they're crying right there. You know, yes. there, there had to be some sort of disconnect for me, which yeah. now I don't feel, I mean, I can't. To this day, I've been in veterinary hospitals with my cats, and I've seen someone crying. I lose it. Yeah. And I think, I used to be the one holding the needle. How did I do that? <laughs> you know? So it's, it's really wild what the human, human brain can do in certain situations and how it can affect you later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. So, so when you're 
experiencing these animals now in in context to to say so let's just when you're experiencing these animals now in a dream and they're they're hurt what mm -hmm. what does that look like it's like how it's do you all, go about it it's all over the place sometimes i'm helping them sometimes i can't get to them they're like in a cage or something um it's it's anything you could name really i mean i i dream about this all the time so <laughs> so i mean that's just never left you has it no i guess not yeah still processing <laughs> well and so that's why i wanted to get to do any of them feel like they're not part of your dreamscape and are sentient like there's an actual you've got a psychic link to something yeah this is something i wanted to talk to you about um and it's very hard for for a lot of people to believe even people that are close to me but my cat um one of my cats died about seven months ago seven eight months ago and he, I actually got from, he was a product of working at the veterinary hospital where somebody brought him in and I just remember this lifeless cat in these people's hands. And this is a little graphic, but his jaw was literally hanging off and one of his eyeballs was hanging out. And I, and I saw him, he's this little ginger cat. I'm gonna pick him off the road. And I thought, okay, we're about to put him down. But instead, veterinarian takes him to the operating room. And they start operating on him and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? What is this? But they put him back together and, you know, he had like a little head tilt all the time. So he kind of asked, looked like he was asking you a question all the time. And one of his eyes, the one that was hanging out was just blind and just forever dilated. So it looked like he had a little pirate patch. And, you know, his teeth just weren't on right. And uh, to release tension of his sutures on his chin, we put sewing buttons in his chin. So I, so I named him Sir Buttons. And he hated people at the veterinary hospital. You couldn't get near him. He was fractious. And every morning for, for like a month after his surgery, I would take him out. And I was the first person to get there. I was the one that was in charge of just feeding all the animals that were boarding or after surgery. So I had a good hour by myself. And I, and I would take him out and for a while he wouldn't come near me. Then he started warming up to me and he would, he got to the point where he was crawling up my lap and he would put his paws around my neck, like a hug. And I could literally hug him. And we spent like a minute or two out of every day like this. And I had a very strict, like, do not bring work home rule. That was not allowed. <laughs> and it was a personal rule. But one day the veterinary um, veterinarian came in, Dr. Craig, he was a little early and he caught us hugging. <laughs> and I remember looking up being like, oh my God, I just got caught. And he was like, oh, Sabrina, you know, that's your cat now. <laughs> and, I, and I just said, is everything paid for? <laughs> <laughs> and I think I took him home that night. But it, was, it wasn't an easy transition. I was living with a roommate that had two cats at the time. I had another cat, still have that other cat. And he hated everybody except for me, he hated everything. So he was very much attached to me. Um, you know, we, we moved to Seattle and now he's okay with my other cat. And, but he's still just, everywhere I went, he was my shadow. You know, he was like my little boy. So when he passed, it was probably maybe a month or so after that he started visiting me. And this is while I'm completely awake. Um, and he's, he's come to visit maybe around nine times now. Um, sometimes it'll be twice a week. Sometimes it'll, it'll be a month. And it always starts where I could feel him jump on the bed. And then I, I know that my other cat's there because I'll kind of wake up or I'm already awake and I can see my other cat there and say, nope, that's not him. And I could feel him walking closer and I could hear him purring and I could feel his fur. I've even opened up my eyes. It was actually Vince that asked me once. He was like, well, have you seen him? And I was like, no, I didn't even think to open my eyes because, you know, you're just so excited. And so I did open my eyes and I, see him as a ghost and it is bizarre 
and I've tried to pet him with my eyes open and it's like my hand will go right through him. Um, but if he's laying next to me and I'm not the one initiating the petting, I could feel him breathing. I could feel his warmth. I could feel his fur. It is the most wonderful experience ever. And it just makes me so happy. And, and it's, and it's happened in times where I've just woken up and you could maybe say, Oh, maybe you were dreaming, but there's been times there just happened last week where I had just gone to the bathroom. I laid down. I wasn't even in like a hypnagogic state and I'm pretty good with knowing where I'm at with dreaming. Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty sure I know when I'm awake. <laughs> so this, this keeps happening and I hope it continues to happen. And I don't know if it will, if, if I, if he's like an impression, maybe if I were to move away from this apartment, maybe it wouldn't happen. I hope, I hope it still would. I, as you know, this is just, that's so, it's so timely and it's giving me the chills. It, so how long has he been dead? I think about, uh, I'm really bad with time. I am too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think about eight months. So it like within a year. Yeah. And before he passed, were you, did you, okay. So before he passed period, before like maybe he was sick or whatever, did you dream with him? No. I mean, not, he had his like places on the bed that he would sleep. You know, they, they have these little habits they would do, but I never really had any dreams with him. The first time after he died, though, that I experienced him was in a dream. And that was, um, I was petting him. And I remember saying, hey, you know that you're dead. You know, we're just in a dream right now. And he responded as, yeah, but this is where we could hang out. This is where we get to see each other. And was this, that's like telepathic? Yeah. And that was a regular dream. I knew I was dreaming, but I I wasn't making it lucid in the way, it was lucid, but it wasn't in a way where I was controlling it. Was it emotional for you? Yeah. And and my grandma actually did the same thing. When she died, I I was in um, a dream and I knew I was in a dream. And I was in this beautiful marketplace. It was almost like a very vibrant colored, like Indian marketplace, you know, uh, vegetables and meats and clothing and dye and everything all around the place. And I remember just walking and thinking, huh, I'm in a dream right now. I could change this. And then having the feeling that I shouldn't. So I just kept walking. And I remember seeing my grandmother start approaching me, you know, walking towards me. And she was much younger but I still knew it was her and we just embraced and we sat down and she was, we just started talking about very mundane things, things that didn't matter. And I knew that when I did see her in a dream or in like an astral projection, I had all these questions set up. None of it mattered. I just knew I was in a dream. I knew I was exactly where I should be. Mm -hmm. And we were just chatting and and it was perfect and beautiful and it felt so calming. I did get to ask though, at the very end, I said, you know, I got to ask you, tell me what the afterlife is like. Mm. And I remember she laughed and then she put her hand on my knee and she said, we'll talk all about it when you get here. And then I woke up. <laughs> so, so these dreams, oh, you don't man, have that's to Yeah, you don't have to have control in order to gain things from them. You can kind of let them play out, even if you know that you're in a dream. Yes. Oh wow, that that's amazing. I had I had a similar dream with uh, my witch mom who died three years ago today, and she, when I first saw her, we were in a basement and she was laughing. Oh, so her there's her corpse, and it's like stiff in a chair and she she's behind it and she just starts laughing with her head rolling back and uh it was first of all it was confirmation again right and Mm -hmm. in it was this laughing this idea of how serious we take it and yet it was that knowing because i wanted to know also and she's just laughing about it and then she walked up the stairs out of the basement Oh my God. I love that. That's so great. 
you, these, you know, it's this stuff, Sabrina, that that on top of all the other mounting evidence, you know, that's going on everywhere, that just reminds me constantly: we don't die. No, no, not at all. So I wanted to get the cat's name, Sir Buttons. Oh, Sir Buttons, right? For obvious reason. Yeah, the buttons. Yeah. <laughs> the gruesome reason. Yeah. <laughs> so one thing I can't help but think about is the fact that you never get any real answers out of these dreams, which makes me think that it's more your own your own consciousness that's filling in, because you don't have the answers either. Possibly, but like, mm-hmm. what not, are not to invalidate are, any experience? Obviously, sorry. What are the answers? to things that are living in different realms though i mean what they're concerned about are you know so different than what we're concerned about that you might go into something thinking that you have a question but it doesn't even process to them or to you if you're in that sort certain state i would imagine that that person you saw processed it because she said we'll talk about it when you get here i suppose it could go either way Mm-hmm. So, yeah, true. But isn't there like, Jerry, it sounds, there seems like there's like a knowing in the laugh. At least there was for Mariah with me. There was like this knowing in her laugh. Yeah. Right. Which you could take either way. <clears throat> and maybe Keep you're not supposed to know. Maybe you're not supposed to know. Yeah. That's part of the prison planet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, a wonderful treat for us later. Yeah. Well, you know, there's 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 so much there to chew on when you're so when you're obe and and since since you're really prolific at that i'd like to really kind of ruminate if we if we can on that we don't get a lot of people that are full on obe often and what does so tell us about your experience with that how the world looks out of body and the architecture of the world as it appears when you're out of body. It's very extremely similar to normal life. I've definitely heard of stories where people say like the walls are a little different or there's different paintings. For me, it's pretty much the same. When I started taking this more seriously, I'd already kind of had an idea with the lucid dreaming where I thought, okay, how can I use this to help myself or other people? And I thought about, like you hear about those people, like monks, but also just regular people that find out they have a tumor or some sort of cancer and they, they go into meditations and they shrink it just by visualization, right? Mm-hmm. You've, you've heard those stories. Yes. Where they can get rid of it just by meditation and visualization. So I started thinking, well, in the lucid state, I could feel things. It doesn't feel like a dream because you can almost physically feel things. So that would be more of a stronger sense of, of meditating, right? And started doing this just with lucid dreaming. I didn't really have anything wrong with me at the time. I mean, I was, I was young and I remember just like trying to get rid of a wrinkle on my face just for science, you know, I'd try to smooth it out or whatever. <laughs> You know, it's the only thing I had to work on myself for at the time. And um, once I started going out of body, I thought, oh, this is even bigger. This is even a better chance. And I remember being, you know, I was very scared of it for a long time. I think probably probably mostly because of the sleep paralysis that would come with it. But the first time that I really started playing with it, I remember I opened up my fridge and I thought to myself, this, something's not right, but I'm not in a lucid dream. So we're closing the fridge and from my fridge, from the kitchen, I could see my bedroom and I saw myself laying there. And normally, like I said earlier, I would just jump right back in my body. But this time I was like, okay, let's see what I could do. And there was a little bottle of aspirin at my kitchen sink. And I tried to grab it. So I was gonna bring it back to myself. <laughs> This was my experiment. This was years ago. But but just like just like a show where you'd see like a ghost, my hand kept going through this this bottle of aspirin and I was just trying to put all my energy into making my hand solid so that I could hold this. 
And so finally, eventually I feel like I had it and I cupped it with both hands and I walked back very calmly to my body. And I remember putting it in my hand, like my body's hand, and then just getting very slowly back into my body. At this point, wake up directly in sleep paralysis. <laughs> now, nothing too weird is going on at this point. I just can't move. And I remember thinking, just look to your left. You have an aspirin bottle. <laughs> just move your head and look at your hand. And finally, when I could, when I broke free of that sleep paralysis, the first thing I did was look over to my hand and my hand was gripping as if there was something in it, but there wasn't, there was nothing there. But I, but I got out of bed and I ran over to the kitchen and there was that aspirin bottle, exactly where I thought it would be. But, but I didn't think that I consciously knew it was there because it wasn't in the rightful place. Maybe a couple of days ago, I had a headache or something. And, um, and that was kind of when I realized, okay, I'm really seeing what's happening now out of body. And I went on to do kind of practices to prove that to myself. And in my way, I, I definitely have proved it. And, and it, it always seems like, like very real. Like I could walk around my apartment. It's still my apartment. I could fly out into the stars and it's gorgeous and beautiful, but I still have to go through my apartment and I see Seattle shrinking as I get further up. Um, and there are different places, like I've been to a different sort of dimension, I guess, before with astral projection, but it's all very, very real to me. And I, and I think that if you stay on this sort of realm that we are now, you know, the, the possibilities are endless, like just with healing, and getting getting to go to a friend's house and you know scanning their chakras you know i, I do reiki so that's Ooh, come basically... do mine. <laughs> what's that come do mine <laughs> <laughs> maybe someday <laughs> yes yes <laughs> i'll pay i have money <laughs> i'll take it <laughs> i've heard a lot of people talk about staying out of astral space because it's controlled and full of nasty shit uh, what have your experiences been around that yeah, there is definitely um, a want to move up and out very quickly. Um, if you do stay around. Yeah, the lower fourth is bad, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you can't have the good without the bad. You just got to deal with it. You got to send it love, and it, it goes away very quickly, in my experience. When you talked about going out like galactic, what were you experiencing out there? It's, it's always just been a body of stars. Um, when I got serious about this two years ago, I kind of just gave in. I started feeling the vibrations and I was like, oh crap, I'm going out again. And this time I, I remember just going out through my friend's building in Seattle and seeing the parking benches shrink and going further and further up to the stars. And I just said, okay, if I'm going to be doing this, and I'm just hanging out with the stars at this point, I just said, if I'm going to be doing this, show me that I'm safe. Show me that I have somebody looking out for me. And then it was like the stars around me started forming. And I had this feeling that they were forming for me, not necessarily because there was an actual image of something, but because I needed to see an image of something. So I saw this beautiful Asian woman and I said, are you, are you one of my guides? And she just you know, nodded her head. Yes. And then I got back in my body and that was what I needed to think that there's something else out there looking out for me or that I'm doing the right thing. So you, you may, it, it sounds like when the, when this is happening, you're, you're doing it, but not having a, like you're being sucked up there. Yeah. So it's not like, it's like out of your control in a weird way. Yeah, for sure. When it started, definitely. And then also like what Jerry was saying at that point in my time, I didn't want to be Down. around. I didn't, yeah, I wanted to go up. That's definitely where I felt safe. 
so now so it, it it sounds like you that was like early on so now you can go up there at will and mm -hmm. and explore do i hear this correctly i i haven't really explored up there too much i haven't been like i want to see the moon or i want to see venus it's that's i really try to stay around here i i've been trying to go do energy work mm -hmm. so so yeah i haven't really explored that too much have you encountered things that we would consider just commonly here et's oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> jerry's yeah. got something there i see him no. I, I don't even want to get into it I do. So give us, t tell us about some of those. I'm deeply fascinated by that, as you know. Okay, so this is, you're, you're talking aliens, right? Yes, yes. No, entities, not aliens. Well, whatever, oh, whatever they are. So I, I've got both. What would you what, like? <laughs> what's the difference? We want both. And yeah. I guess give us your idea of what the difference is. Yeah. Okay, so I'm thinking gray alien, like, that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. then there's also entities, maybe more like fairy type elementals. That's kind of where I'm putting them. Okay. And and so give us examples of your experiences with both. Both. Okay. Um I was in Austin, Texas at a Motel 6, and I hadn't even fallen asleep yet. I remember feeling the vibrations thinking, oh my God, I'm not even asleep. But I got out of my body and this was towards the earlier times. Like I said, I only started taking this seriously two years ago. So there's been a lot of exploration that's happened in those last two years. So I get out of my body and I walk through the front door of the Motel 6 and I can see the swimming pool that was right outside of our window. And I, and I just said, okay, guides take me to someone that i could talk to take me to another guide so here's the difference i don't know if we actually went through it with the the flying when you're an ap at least for me uh, or out of body at least for me it feels like i'm not the person that's doing the flying there's no control it feels like a hand almost like a giant hand has me and i'm gliding somewhere and it's turning, it's taking turns. It's, it's, it's definitely a motion of where I need to go. There's a direction, but I have no say in it. So I'm feeling this and I remember seeing trees go by and kind of trying to duck with all these trees and thinking, oh, I don't, I don't need to duck. You <laughs> know, I'm not solid. And, and I remember seeing people on the streets just kind of fly by and I'm not sure if they were out of bodied people or if they were real people. On the street and I was just kind of going by like a ghost I have no idea but I ended up in the woods and there's actually a lot of woods in in Austin Texas which I found out the next day when I explored it a little bit more but I'm in the woods and there's this creature that's kind of poking his head out of like a tree and I have the distinct impression that he doesn't want to show me his full self because he thinks it might scare me. This character is like a gnome. And I've never believed in gnomes. You know, my only experience is David the Gnome from Nickelodeon, which I wasn't into, honestly. There was that hotel like that. one too, Expedia, Travel Gnome. True, and I was in a hotel. Maybe yeah. there's a connection. They probably projected Maybe it into your... For our psyche, yeah. yeah. To <laughs> but he was kind of like hiding himself and i said okay okay i uh, are you a guide and he goes yep and then kind of just got distracted and i said am i am i on the right path and he looks at me and he goes yes and then he starts walking away and i said no 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 wait and he turned back around and i said what am i supposed to do with this and he looked at me and said the weirdest thing. He said, you should focus on the newly deceased. And then he walked away. And I remember just st standing there in the woods, like, focus on the newly deceased. I thought about it for a minute. And then I just 
went straight back to my body in the same direction, but just opposite um, with this hand kind of moving me. And it wasn't until, you know, weeks later, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a Buddhist that he was like, you know, maybe you should be doing some sort of work with uh, people that are about to die or people that have crossed over. And I haven't really had that opportunity yet, although I've kind of tried before, but um, maybe something for me to, I always keep in the back of my mind as a possibility. That's, that's really intense. And it's definitely, I mean, it was a solid communication that I personally would follow up on. Yeah. That is, uh, I mean, it's remarkable. And and so you would put that in the, that's in the realm of, that's not in the realm of the ETs that. That's, no, that's like elemental. Yeah, yeah, that's the way I was reading that. And yeah. so what if, okay. And have you experienced that one again also? No, nothing quite like that. No, no, no. Is that, I mean, that's just such a direct communication. Yeah. Yeah. That. And then, and then, of course, when we tie that into your experience with Mr. Buttons, Sir Buttons, he's knighted. Oh, Sir Buttons, <laughs> that's right, he's knighted. <laughs> the good Sir Buttons, and all oh, tippity top, and <laughs> and then also with this message you received from your grandmother that is, you know, laughing knowingly about your question about what's going on on the other side. I'm seeing a thread here like almost like a like a jokester sort of trickster type of thread or like a nonchalant or what no like a like a a direction to move in like this is a this mm-hmm. seems like a significant solid set of synchronicities that uh are pointing you in that in that direction in a good way yeah oh yeah all, all signs point to go so far for me and I don't feel like I'm quite there where like the gnome was talking about, but I don't think time really means too much and I'm still pretty young. So I feel like at some point, you know, I'll collect enough learnings to be where I'm comfortable with, you know, in some sort of way, helping people pass over whatever that means. I'm not sure yet. Yeah. Well, well, that's, that's one of the things, I mean, nobody really knows and Mm -hmm. until you know, that club right right? and so that's part of the really great thing about pondering it so Mm -hmm. give us an experience with what you would consider ets alien uh yeah this one was pretty um pretty recent a couple months ago i will preference this with i had just watched the fourth kind which i thought was a very scary movie Ooh, that one's creepy. <laughs> yeah, it turns out it's none of it's real. Like there's some weird things that happen in Alaska, but nothing like they're making it out to be. At this point, I didn't know that. I thought it was yeah. a very real film. Yeah, um, they, well, they present it that way. Yes, yes. But it's more like the Blair Witch, I guess. They're like, here's this actual footage. No, not not actual. Yeah. Um but so also would, with that, like Sabrina, what it does is it, it extends that bit of magic of suspension of disbelief, right? Where you're right. engaged in it. I mean, I was completely engaged in it. It really had me uh, fully there with the experience thinking that job. it was real. Yep. Yep. I guess I can't fault them, but I, I don't know. <laughs> I well, think it's, it's, it's trickery. Yeah, I know. Based on a true story, okay. Don't say that if it's not. <laughs> <I know. laughs> it's not fair. I'm too gullible. <laughs> um, but okay. So that being said, I was already pretty terrified, and I had an experience where I woke up in sleep paralysis, and I was laying on my left side, and I just knew there was what I would consider a gray alien behind me and I could feel that he was digging into my shoulder with one of his fingers and I was I couldn't move and I was just like you know I was yelling at him in my brain like stop stop leave me alone stop this and he was just very calmly like you stop you know this has to happen what are you doing 
why are you even trying to turn around? You don't want to see me anyways. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. But, but I'm still, you know, trying to fight. And I remember trying to fight to turn on the light next to me. And he was just like, no, I'm, I'm doing a job. Stop. And then all of this was like in brain conversation and I'm still terrified. I'm struggling. And I remember he leaned in and he whispered, not, not in my brain, but in my ear with words, he said, groundskeeper for life. And then, and then I was released and I could wake up. I woke up. He was gone. I turned the light on finally. And I was like, oh my God, what happened? So now I'm, I have my light on and I can't go to sleep. I'm, I'm so scared. I went to the mirror. I looked to see if there's any markings on my shoulder. There wasn't, thank goodness. And I just was like, all right, well, that, that was sleep paralysis. Okay. And then when I finally did a couple hours later, start falling asleep again. Oh, I forgot to mention that when this started happening, my room was shaking almost like a, like an earthquake. And, um, so that, that same feeling that it doesn't usually happen for sleep paralysis with me, but it started happening again, so the second time in the night. And I was like, Oh my God, are you kidding me? Like, did he forget something? Like, why, why is this happening again? And there was a clear message in my mind that said, you know, exactly how to get out of this. And I thought, Oh God, I do. So I, instead of being there, I use that moment to get out of my body. And I, I don't, I don't really remember what I did. I was very quickly back in it, but I got to avoid whatever the shaking and the paralysis that was about to happen. Strange thing is this happened a few months ago. I'm talking to Vince about it and I'm talking to him about the differences between, um, like negative entities in sleep paralysis. And I was telling him that I kind of have two theories. One theory is, is that kind of like the Carl Jung theory, these shadow people, the sleep paralysis kind of has a way to teach something about yourself. Maybe it's the darker parts of yourself that you haven't thought about. And I've definitely gotten teachings from sleep paralysis before. My other thought that I'm working with is that there are actual negative entities and they feed off of fear. And, and that's actually kind of a good thing because the world doesn't need all that fear, doesn't need all that hatred. And there's the idea that something is able to feed off of it is good. As I'm explaining this to him, he goes, oh, kind of like tending a garden. And I just turned white and I remember all my goosebumps came up my hair stood on end. I'm like, what? I was like, what do you mean tending a garden? He goes, well, these negative entities would be tending a garden. And I go, that's exactly what a groundskeeper does. And it just hit me. (laughs) That's exactly what that alien figure was telling me. (laughs) Months later, two, three months later. And it, it, this was uh, two weeks ago that Vince said that to me. And it's still, I'm still processing it. I don't know what that means. <laughs> it's, it's a little too like coincidental. Uh, how familiar are you with conspiracy theories around grays and and uh, energetic vampirism that goes on from the astral on humans by these entities? I I have my own theories. I haven't read too much into other people's. Okay. That's a common theme, that we are an energy farm for these things. It might not have started out that way, but that's what apparently it's grown into. And on the other side of that, we've got the human controllers, i.e. governments, are purposely generating that fear energy in people by whatever means they can in order to help their buddies so they get rich and powerful. There's some kind of symbiotic relationship there. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. That would make a lot of sense for what's going on now in the world. Absolutely, it does, unfortunately. (laughs) Ooh, I want to think about that some more. I like that. 
it's it's fodder for the thought mill for sure oh, it really is yeah bringing it to a very real everyday level mm-hmm. yeah that's amazing you know how many people were terrified of nuclear war or are terrified of nuclear war you know that might have a specific pack of entities that feed off of that particular frequency of fear who knows right yeah wow yeah, uh, right. Someone, Amanda just told, said in chat that, give me your louche, that Robert um, Monroe called that energy louche. Louche? Louche. Yes. Okay. That mm-hmm. fear energy. And I'm going to write that down. Yeah, you should read Journeys Out of Body, I think it's called. Yeah, Robert Monroe's amazing. Yeah, you should really read that book. Yeah, I mean, of course I've heard of him, and I only recently started collecting some books about out of body stuff. I think I definitely didn't want to feel like I was taking anyone else's ideas. So maybe I was making things harder on myself because I was doing it naturally. I didn't want to. No, you, know. you did it right because I'm the same way. I don't like to read other people's shit and then get front loaded right. with all this stuff. So I don't read front-loaded. anything. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but now I'm at a point where I'm like, okay, I've done this so much that I could actually start reading this. So yeah, maybe I, I can start you know, reading some Robert Monroe books. Well, that this is what's impressive about you. This has all happened naturally for you and it's it's brought you to where you are. So it it, you know, we become our own experts in a in a way. Yeah, I mean it's it's happened naturally in a way, but I, I definitely worked for it. I worked for it with the lucid dreaming. And I think that anyone can do this. I don't think there's anything special about me and i definitely want people to try i want people to do this because you never know what's going to happen to you you can get hit by a car and be paralyzed and be stuck in a hospital forever or for long enough and it's like if you could just have that tool of escape that could save your sanity that could save save you from you know being in misery or whatever it is I have heard this, that exact um, antidote so many times from people that are in prison or have been completely paralyzed or um, on induced comas where they, they had, that was the option to get body. There was no other option. They're stuck for what, you know, whatever the circumstances were and how they could go anywhere you you know you know if you know yeah well even further than that let's say you escape this lifetime without being in prison or without having your body as a prison or your mind as a prison and 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 then you die maybe you're practicing for the bardo you yes. know you, you just <laughs> know I, I just there's so many implications where this could help you in your life and i and i just want people to I really want to give this knowledge to people. I want to tell people, keep trying, keep doing it. And I'm on all these Facebook, you know, groups. And I see so many people that get stuck with like, well, are my chakras clean enough? Is my pineal gland? Maybe I yeah, should. Yes. Maybe I should. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, no. All you have to do is practice. Yes. It. It's a muscle, basically. Yeah, it's a muscle. Forget everything else. You know, I drink, whatever. Just it's not because I'm vegetarian that I can do this. It's because <laughs> <I> practice. <laughs> I have a couple questions about, so in OBE, when you encounter your reflection, how does that play Ooh. out? Um, I'm a lot of different people mm-hmm. in my reflection. I'm give never- us a, more... Give us a sampling. Oh, it, it's just like a Rolodex. I've, I've, I've looked in a mirror- I think just only once, but it was like, I saw so many different, I was a man, I was this, I was this, I was a child, I was, you know, just so many different people, just, just spiraling through in the same, same mirror. It's beautiful. It is. It's, a, it's really astonishing. And I recommend anyone that even if you're, well, for me, it's a trick to lose if just in the lucid aspect it is always a trick for me to get lucid is find the reflection but it, obe is a whole different experience where it's almost like uh i like your idea of a rolodex but it, it feels like uh, i ponder are these me's from other like time frame life frames 
you know, what are I my just so so you've had the same kind of experience? Yes, I, I naturally go to reflective surfaces be in a room right now. This is the whole scrying thing we we're talking about earlier. In a, any room and even waking life, I am right when I go in, I, my eye always goes towards reflective surfaces so that I can see everything going on. So I'm looking at at glass, at mm-hmm. mirror. It's just a natural function I do. I'm not sure yeah. where I picked it up. And I, I do that also in dreams and OBE. The, so you far surpass me on OBEs. It's not, it, I am working on trying to get it to be more habitual, like you have it. Sometimes, some months are better than others. I could have a night where I do it five times in a night and I could have, you know, a month where I do it twice. So also, I wanted to ask this question earlier. So I had all these questions written down here. Are you able to look in on people you know? That's, I mean, this is always one of the things. So give us some examples of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I can give you, um, I can give you the best example. And that this is also in a video of one of my YouTube videos. Um, this is kind of what I call proof, at least for myself. I had a friend who, I, I was very aware of the layout of his house. And he put a playing card face up on his nightstand. And this is when I was not around. He let me know it was there. And it took me about a month to get there. Not a month to get it right. But there'd be times where I'd get out of my body and I'd say, all right, take me to his house. And I would get too excited and I'd get right back in my body. When I finally made it to his house, I knew that he had a dog. I knew that he was sleeping and everything was dark. And I was like, okay, don't look over at where he is. Just look at this nightstand where this card is. And it was so messy. I remember it being very messy and thinking, where is this card? And then I saw it, but I saw it almost like a hologram. Like the card started coming up from off the table in this glowing sort of fashion. And I see it's a black five. And I am an only child that has not played many cards. So it's a black five squiggly. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And I'm saying spades at the time. I'm like, okay, I think it's, it's, a, it's a five of spades. So I quickly go back into my body, wake up immediately, grab my phone, text him. It's four in the morning. I say five of spades. That's all I said. And then hours pass by. He's sleeping in, and I haven't been able to go back to sleep. And I'm just like so worried. I got this wrong. Then it disproves everything I'm thinking. You know, I like my life is about to be shattered or confirmed. So it's hours of just like waiting for this text. I get the text, and it says close five of clubs. And I'm like, oh my God, close enough. Cause I don't know the difference between clubs and spades. <laughs> I saw black squiggle <laughs> and a five. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was one or the other. I was so happy and I still have this little card. He gave it to me, it's on my nightstand. He had no reason. He knew, he knew how important this was to me and there was no reason for him to lie to make me feel good. That's, that is seriously fantastic. And it, 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 okay. So just to parse this out a bit, have you, this is not a body experience. Have you done a remote viewing that is quite different? They're, you know, they, I think they play out differently. Totally. I, I struggle with the actual difference other than if you were to ask a remote viewer what they're doing, they always say that they're fully awake um they're not traveling out of body but i feel like you get the same same thing you know um the times so I, that i've done it it's been more of a visualization exercise right it's not a full sensory thing at least for me it hasn't been yeah so i've, I've done something that's definitely confused me along those lines where i think it's very blurred i tried to go 
see another friend at this this time and I was taking a nap on my couch, realized I was out of my body and I said, okay, take me to so-and-so's house. And I start, you know, moving there, like the hand has grabbed me, I'm moving. But I end up at this weird mansion. It's not his house. And I was it half? I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> upset. I'm like, why am I here? But I'm trying not to get too emotional about it because I don't want to get zapped back into my body. So I open the doors and I go through and there's like this huge ballroom. And on the I'm looking at it from the doors, and on on the right side, there's just columns and columns of tables that are set up and they're they're set up for tea like afternoon tea like british tea where the 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 tea kettles are all empty and there's just you know tea there and then on the left side are all these washer and dryers and they each have these single use like soap and fabric on them but nothing's washing and drying and I'm going, what the heck is this? And so at this point, I get back in my body. First thing I do is grab the phone. I call him. I say, what are you doing? He's like, what do you mean? I go, what are you doing right now at this moment? What are you doing? And he goes, um, well, I'm, I'm making tea and I'm about to do laundry. And I go, wait, what? <laughs> he goes, there's a towel over my shoulder right now. I'm on the way to do laundry. And I started making tea. I didn't even know this guy was a tea drinker. <laughs> so great. So this is where it gets weird, where it's like, it's almost like an in-between. Because I feel like that's more like remote viewing. Jay, right. what, what do you think about that? Uh, I'm not sure. My, my experience is limited strictly to remote viewing at this point. I've never lucid dreamed or astral projected. I'm... Mm -hmm. But you had real hits, Jerry, remote viewing. Yes. I seem to be proficient at that. But yes. it's, it's, you got to be in the right state of mind. You have to be focused and you just, you have to take what you get and work with it and, you know, intend to explore that vision because they'll come and flip. For me, it comes in a flash. And much like when you get emotional and you're snapped back in your body, when you have that vision, and if you're not focused on it, any little distraction, will, it's gone. Hmm. It, and that's, at least this has been my experience with it. Right. As for, I, think they're, I think they're different. I think they're a different experience. Oh, I do too. I think, uh, I don't think there's any, this is just my, my opinion, I don't think there's any projection involved with remote viewing. I think it's more of a, tuning into where that information is stored in the cloud versus so I, could, I could understand that and i could understand myself going out of body but this was the only case where i don't i really don't understand it seems like a middle ground i'll have to listen again after the show and i'll let you know if i have any more thoughts about it yeah think on it because i was only half paying attention i'm sorry <laughs> It's I'm, fine. Just, I'm doing other yeah, stuff. Every, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's <laughs> running. He's running everything. Yeah. Um, so this and this is this is also timely because uh, Dark Journalist, one of our one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite people on YouTube, Olivia and Daniel, were talking about doppelgangers a couple weeks ago in the X series that they're doing. Oh. I have often wondered, and I still wonder with the, as even in connected connection to like ghostly apparitions, if we're being perceived when we're out of body in a, possibly in the doppelganger sense where we're, we're really tangible and solid to people so we can appear fully formed and, and they can see us maybe from across a room or interact with us, not realizing that we're actually fully formed astrally in front of them and then be maybe less so where we appear like an apparition and the and the connection here is that we're actually obe and in our body and so we're not a ghost at least as far as we know and 
Okay, so what are your thoughts on being perceived by those apparently in the waking state while you're OPE? I haven't experienced it yet. I'll let you know when I do. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, no one's no one's ever claimed to have seen me or felt me leave or felt me even have sleep paralysis while I'm having it right next to them. So I I don't know. Oh really? Mm-hmm. Sure, you're 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 <laughs> muted. <laughs> I just had a crazy question come to mind. So go ahead. Finish, finish Shoot. Your th- no no no. I was laughing at you talking before so, you were muted. So what about Vince? Is he proficient at this like you do you guys travel together have you had sex not, in the astral not plane at with him? I, yeah. no his he's not <laughs> we're very similar but we're very different so we kind of have different takes on similar fringe topics um which which makes it interesting and i think that someday i'll probably pressure him to pursue it a little bit but right now he's so he's nuts you know, and bolts he's a nuts and bolts guy he is. I mean, he, he believes in all this stuff, which is amazing. Like dating him has been the best thing that's ever happened to me, but, but he, he, he's going to make a video about it. He's going to share his love about it. He's not going to necessarily, you know, it. spend the time right now to do that because he's spending his time, you know, creating in a different way. Cool. Yeah. Well, you guys got to, do the astral sex and come back and report how that was. <laughs> oh my God, yes. <laughs> Relationship goals. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, right? Absolutely. Put that on the list. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Okay, so what are your thought what are your thoughts then on on actual so this is this has kind of been a theme throughout actually with you, even though I don't know that it, it 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 seems to me to be a theme with the information you're getting from the ethers. What are your thoughts on the process of death and dying? And so you talked about it a little bit with your grandma. You asked her this, and mm-hmm. she gave you that. But what are, where you stand right now? What are how are you feeling about it? What goes on? Personally, I can't wait. There's no thought in my mind that when you die, it's not going to be amazing. I think it's going to be a crazy adventure, even, you know, more so than what I experience when I'm out of my body. It'll, it'll, it'll just be amazing. Um, you'll have all the control that I don't have right now that I strive for. Um, and I feel like when people die around me, I, I'm sad and I, and I, I, but I'm sad for myself. I'm sad for the loss, the physical loss, like we were talking about earlier, I think before we went on but I'm not sad for them. There's never a point where I think, oh, they died so young, they could have done so much, or they had so much more to give. Those thoughts, I don't understand them. Um, I think that when people die, it's simply a, a grief into ourselves, but, but I feel nothing for, for that person except for joy. Yeah, that's, that's always how, especially with humans, that's, exactly mm-hmm. where i've always been with it it is it is that's why i i think sometimes i seem stoic to like if it's a social circle or family when it's someone we know close you know and i'm i'm not broken down by it right so yeah i'm with you on that what yeah. do you I, I love your stance by the way it reminds me of montana jordan she's always yay death it, um yeah. Yeah, you know that's like her hashtag. It's Love so it. great. I, I, I feel that. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think that also sets you up for some work that I think you'll be doing in the future around this area. Clearly, you're yeah. getting those messages. So mm-hmm. that I can't wait for updates from you. <laughs> Yeah, that would be fun. I feel like things change, you know, every year new 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 things happen. It'd be fun to come back on at some point. Yeah. Do you okay, so in in dreams or okay, so in any of these states, deep water, and that's this is something I'm just interested in in general. What do you have any experiences with deep water? Anything going on with deep water? Things in water? I have um, 
a reoccurring dream where I'm, there's a certain swimming hole that I have and uh, I know how to get there. And sometimes there's a uh, belugas there and they're different colors. There's like four of them, mm-hmm. purple, blue, pink. Um, I don't remember the other color, but yeah, the, that's it though. I, I'm not, not really into deep waters. Even watching it on TV kind of makes me nervous. Like I want to hold my breath in a weird way. Oh, well, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. What? Uh, so we talked a little bit about space and all that, and and we talked about it in relation to OBEs. Mm-hmm. But what about in general dreams? No space dreams. Nope, not one. And also in this kind of in the dream dream realm and not OBE experience, do you still get? Fear dreams that aren't related to say that you can directly relate to anxiety in your out of your waking life. Oh yeah. I mean, just two days ago in my dream, half of my gum of my, you know, those teeth dreams, except yes. it was my gum and I was just holding it thinking like this, someone going to put together my gums, you know, so, <laughs> oh, you know, those kind of dreams. Yeah. All the time. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to knock some of that out. Mm-hmm. I, I used to have a ton of teeth dreams like that that I was losing my teeth, and I just started losing my teeth. Like all of a How sudden, long ago, Jerry, were you How having problems solved? <laughs> yeah, yes yeah, so and no. Um, what ish? How long ago? How long ago were you? Yeah, ten years ago. Okay, interesting because you you did lose that one too. But that's ten years later. So yeah, but it could be a result of the 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 molars I lost from all the. See, I was grinding my teeth in my sleep. That's what was happening. So, mm-hmm. and I found out too late, but I think those dreams are related to my grinding. And it's kind of messy. Mm-hmm. Hey, if you keep grinding your teeth, they're going to fall out. So, mm-hmm. don't grind your teeth, everybody. No, I know. I'm a to- tooth grinder oh. in my sleep. So, terrible. So, also, and then before we get questions from the audience, sleep paralysis stuff. So, you've mentioned it a few times, but we never actually honed in on it for a second to to suss out anything so i'm looking for a kind of the general experience for sleep paralysis for you shadow people and demons definitely wanting something from me and i figured out through years of dealing with them to just i mean as cheesy as it is you think love you shoot little love beams you tell them they have no power over you it works. It works every time. And before you got to that, before you came to that realization and praxis of it, did you have any bad experiences where they were actually feeding upon you? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, I've definitely woken up after, from one like sucking from my lips. And um and feeling the most tired I've ever felt the next day at work. I just couldn't. Oh, wow. Also, oh, it was awful. Was it was it, awful. Like, was I was a dementor. Great. Yeah. Yeah, it felt like that. <laughs> that's pretty classic. We here at yeah. Noxment, they do recommend that you kill these things and, and eat them yourself. You consuming <laughs> them, you'll absorb their energy. And that's definitely our recommendation in all cases. Oh my god! Ren Collier does that. He beats them up and eats them. Takes he just absorbs them. That sounds scary to me. I don't want that in me. (laughs) (laughs) He did it. That that show's really great. He did it. It was like an instant. He was just so pissed that something actually had the nerve. It got up. It kind of huddled up behind him, mind you, too. And he's a big guy, and he. He was just pissed off that something was doing that to him. That it was it just he just sprung into action with I'm going to oh beat the shit out of it. And then as he's deciding to do that, he just eats it. That and is hilarious. That's I ballsy. Know. <laughs> That's ballsy. My hat off to him. That's crazy. <laughs> well, what you know the thing is whatever works. So you send yep. you send love to it and to mm-hmm. them, and they go away. Ren eats them. You know the, yeah. so. The, the thing is, we don't need to fear them. Exactly. Yeah. However that works out. Yep. I think, do we have questions? Yeah, we have one question. I haven't looked. 
chat. I do have one from before though. Um, does alcohol affect your astral travel? If so, how? I would love to say no, but I think it it makes it better sometimes. And this is something that you I never hear in the community, but um, it for me it makes it so that I'm not quite asleep. You know, I'm a little disturbed. So if I have some alcohol before I go to bed, my sleep patterns are a little off and I'm a little more conscious of that. So I actually OBE a little bit better after a few beers. Do you, so, so we're in a state where this is legal. So marijuana, do you engage in that? No, not since I was younger. It doesn't appeal to me. So when you were younger, did it affect your dreams at all? Nope. Yeah, see oh. that for me also it it had no yeah. ice they there's like this myth that it, it you don't dream or you don't have these experiences and it's it never affected me. I and, have a friend that purposely smokes marijuana cuz he says he hates his dreams and it cures him of dreams. It, it never affected me either, but it works for him. Yeah, it's a, it's just interesting that there's a overlaying like grand there's a grand arch of a statement where it's like, a, you just, if you smoke, you don't dream. And it's, I, it's, that's yeah. Alex. I think people are, are feeding into that. No, we live in a, a placebo based reality. Okay. <laughs> if you believe something that strongly, it's going to be true for you. Mind reality, and stories. Yeah. Reality is subjective. We live in a placebo based universe. Go with um, it, folks. <laughs> Sabrina, you've brought the most OBE stuff. Congratulations. I mean, you another have question. Another question. really, I just am just wanting to thank her for this. We haven't yeah. had, uh, this is almost a full show on OBE stuff. And she has many more stories, I'm sure. I do. Uh, do, you, do you mind if I use the bathroom real quick? No, yeah, no, go we on. Do it. We'll, we'll get. I got, okay. Yeah, you we'll, guys chat. We'll chat. We'll call out some people. CW's here in chat. Welcome, CW. Fractal oh, Truth. Okay. W. Hey, Fractal. Suzanne. Charles Williamson finally made it to a live show. Charles, Suzanne. Amanda. Some dude named Wad was here before saying hi Wad's to you. Wad's my good friend. I love Wad. He said he missed you dearly. Yes, Wad and I are very good friends in real life. Did, did you laugh at his name? Never. I, I thought it was not real when I first mm -hmm. met him, and it's really real. It's, he's really, his name's Wad. Imagine if his first name was John, and that was his middle name. <laughs> I know it would have been a million jokes. Watt is an awesome guy. I love him to death. Is my Darcy out there? Darcy's here. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's been a good turnout tonight. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Nice I'm coming. thrilled. And so, no questions for the, I mean, this has been a remarkable night of OBE. We, yeah, Jerry, Sabrina when have we? Awesome. When have we talked this much about OBEs? Uh, Rufus Cat. <laughs> yes. And run right so and also i do want to stress that on the difference between sabrina and ren these things that people get caught in that they think are in control of them we have the power over them absolutely that's probably true that they're part of you yes yeah i think so it's, too it's likely i think it's like it's very likely or it's somehow can it's connected into that. Well, I don't know. When people get out of body, everyone talks about these things at the lower level of the astral of the mm -hmm. ether. Mm -hmm. So it's like the DMT with the the, you know the the what do they call them, Jerry? Uh, yeah, the uh, machine elves or the jesters. Right. So there's a lot of chatter that is coherent between peoples across cultures and stuff about this so there's something to that well if if, if you've got people if you've got different groups of um, say tribes right you've got those tribes that speak different languages one way that can all communicate is in a common symbolic space and maybe that is the unity dream time that uh, that many cultures talk about and that people say it's coming back so Hopefully, I yeah. just want us to have more of these experiences together uh, in small groups and in bigger collectives. And then, you know, and it starts personally, but we can all do this, people. <laughs> right. Get out right, of your right. body. 
get away from the 5G. So I have, I have, I personally have questions. I wrote down, I forgot. So in your Reiki practices, um, have, have you, your master, you said, so have you ever seen a gray soul leave a human that you're working on? No. Or an entity, a gray entity rise up out of? No, I live in a really kind of run down old apartment in Seattle. I don't have many people coming in for okay. a physical practice okay. um, besides people that I know. Okay. Um, otherwise, I just do it, you know, distance. And no, I haven't had the opportunity for that. What What's going on? Should I be prepared? If you set up your own practice, absolutely, because you're apparently a beacon for these energy demon things, whatever they are. The, uh, they appear as grays. That just seems to be a common uh, parasitic entity form, I think. That's what we're looking at there. They're around, Sabrina. There multiple people talk about them, practitioners. Yeah, yeah. and I, you're the first you're the first Reiki master I've talked to that hasn't seen one. Oh, I'm very new. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I hate to front load you on that, but you're going to be seeing them. They, uh, <laughs> they, from what, this is my opinion, my determination that they're, they are the attachments. And because yeah. you have that sight, if you will, you can see their form or you interpret their energy as that form. Mm -hmm. But they're just, you know, parasites. Yeah. Yeah. Well, different people call them different things. I mean, I've heard, right. you know, some people refer to them as, as basically gray aliens, gray ETs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's just the whole spectrum of people's, you know, of the human the human experience let's see here's the thing the, the, this is what i've been thinking about lately is that the the gray form ha has been seen even in cave paintings going back you know tens of thousands of years so that form has been around they've got the ant man of the hopi or same sort of the big eyes round head maybe these are these archetypes have a visual pattern that we associate with that energy. If you think about how people talk about how consciousness works, that we're projecting and we're projecting this out and there's an energetic field in front of us of information and we interpret it. Our brain, you know, converts it to visual and, and sensory feedback, right? Mm -hmm. So what if in our library of images for whatever type of energy they are is that gray form? So, you know, it's just kind of hardwired into us. It could be even that they're part of our DNA. So we Yeah, have... and it's just a way to communicate the same feeling to, to different people. Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Sorry, I <laughs> I got thoughts. Mm-hmm. I like those. I have I have a lot to I chew love on. It. And then my last question was, have you done DMT, ayahuasca, any of that crazy shit? No, okay. I used to do LSD when I was like 16, 17, and I'm pretty much just done. It, you know, I asked a friend because, you know, DMT got pretty popular and he was telling me that he did it. And I, you know, I'm 35 and I, and I said, do you think, do you think I should do it? And he quoted somebody, you probably know who said it, but he goes, Sabrina, you picked up the phone, you got the message, you could hang up. And I was just like, all right, that's fair. Yeah, I feel like, I kind of experience a lot of what I hear from, from DMT experiences anyways. So I'll, I'll leave it alone. The people that I talk to that are really, you know, super excited about it are ones who have healed from it. They actually get that psychological healing that they need when, during mm -hmm. that experience, wherever that is or what is. Yeah. It's, oh, I, think it's, I, think, I think it's a wonderful thing for a lot of people. I don't think it's right. something. Those are that... people going in. Yes. Yeah. Oswald Spengler says he thinks well, Timothy and Leary again, said it. What's Oswald say? Hello, Oswald, by the way. The Timothy Leary. That's a quote by Timothy Leary. Oh, yeah. Timothy Leary. Yeah, there you go. And apparently, you have the energy warrior, warrior S <laughs> voice tonight. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> says bb i don't know what that means but i'll I, take it <laughs> you're hell on wheels in the astral nice <laughs> all 
All right. Who? Oh, okay. I found. <laughs> I found. I'm looking for questions. I, you know. Oh, wait. See, when Nish gets real excited, this. Yeah, Nish is kind of roboting. Were your parents in the military or politics? My stepdad was in the military. Did you ever live on a base? Yep. As a young child, from younger than seven? Uh, third to eighth grade. So yeah, right around younger than seven, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, Any... Bowling Air Force Base in D.C. My, my stepdad part... was yeah. Secret Service for Clinton. Were you... Uh... Part of the TAG program or the special, what they call it, talented and gifted programs or anything like that? No. Special school clubs? No nope. missing time or anything? Those no. seem to be a hotbed for picking for military programs to get kids into, you know, psychic shit. Yep. No, none of that. That you remember. <laughs> that I remember. I'm kidding. No, that's interesting. Are you back, Nish? Let's see. Are you a witch, too? I think you said yes. No, you're not a witch. You're, yeah. witchy. you're witchy. Yeah, I, I wouldn't put myself in a box, but yeah, I, I might consider myself a witch. Yeah, fuck labels. Yeah, I mean, I don't really do spells, but I definitely do ritual. All right, now I'm stalling. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah there she is. <laughs> Somebody wants to know if you're a witch in, in your teenage years. <laughs> oh my God. Like, I've never heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. All right, I'm done. I grilled. All right. Oh, she dropped off again. No. Oh. Should we wait? I'll look up who's coming down next week. Got some okay. We got some killer guests coming. Oh, she's back. Hear me? Yep. <laughs> Next week we have John Razin. You can hear me. Yeah, we can. Okay, uh, good. Are we good? <laughs> All right, well, Nish says goodbye. I, I've... This has dropped for me three times. You're too excited. You two have something going on. Cut it out. At least it was towards the end. That's yeah, okay. That's true. Yeah. We, we got a lot of good stuff in there. All right. I'm very excited. Yeah, are we still alive? Me? Should I even try? Sorry, Nish. Yeah, it's just a, it's a robot, what we can here. All right, Nish, hold on. Let me just finish up. So anyway, thank you, everyone. Next week, we have John Rasmus. However, it's going to be on Thursday night, not Wednesday. So Thursday night, and I think it's at 10 o'clock. And that was because he has a weird job, a real job. It's at 9 o'clock. So 9 o'clock next Thursday, the 21st. Um, and after that, we've got some really... Interesting people coming on. Jason Miller, the week after that, magician guy. And Michael Wan, the guy from the Susquehanna. What's that called? I forget. He's gotten real interesting uh, research in all these rituals that have been performed and are being performed all along the Susquehanna River. And he's basically got this analogy that it's, metaphorically, it's a, an energy that will power all these rituals. The river is like this river of energy that powers these rituals. And then he goes through all the research of all the things that happened on or around the Susquehanna and grown out of it. Like, I think one is like the, the Rock and Roll or Baseball Hall of Fame is on the river. You know, and that, the whole story behind that. Interesting dude. He's been on the Higher Side Chats a few times if you've ever listened to that show. Anyway. Cool guess. Okay, look. Screw Nish. She's she's done. I guess. I'm here, oh, but I don't know. hear me. Yeah, yeah. It's, has Sabrina been able to plug her sites? Oh and no, all yeah, that? yeah. Tell us everyone where you can be. Uh, 
Yeah, you could find me everywhere at Astral Palms. So it's astralpalms.com. And then all the major social media sites are Astral Palms. And yeah, check out my website and get a healing from me or, or just uh, watch my YouTube videos where I explain more detail on how to actually do this stuff. And all of those links are in the description and also they'll be in the show notes on the Discord server and in the podcast. Uh, let's see. Thank you so much. It's been fantastic talking to you. It's been seriously fabulous. We, I hope we. I, so fun. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> You See? warned me, Sabrina warned us early on that she this stuff ha I I've not ever been kicked off of Nox Mente this many times. <laughs> no, you haven't. That's why I was like, what's going on with you guys? <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> All right. Do you have anything else to say, Nish? No. Okay. Thank you, everyone okay. that's yeah. in the, the chat. Thank you always, of course. Yes, thanks. And we'll see you all next week. Have yeah, thank you guys so much. Anytime. Have a great night, everyone.